Good morning. Welcome, everyone. The sun is shining. And we are here. How many are glad you came this morning? Come on, I mean, why would you not be? You know, the Lord's already here. Amen? He's been waiting. He's excited. Look at this row here. That's a serious row right there. He's been waiting for you guys to come. And uh, we're just going to have a great time in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? So why don't we stand together? We're going to pray and uh, we're going to worship the Lord. The kids are going to, a little later, are going to go down and have special time downstairs. I'm looking forward to sharing the word this morning on Pergamum. From Revelation chapter 2. Get your seatbelt on. Wow. It's Pergamum. Wow. Let's pray. Father, thanks for a chance to be together today. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine. And Lord, we just thank you that your Son, the Son of God, is shining in our hearts today. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray for your presence, the very real, genuine uh, feel of your presence in this house, Lord. We thank you that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We know you already abide in us, but there is something about when the people of God come together. It says where two or three are gathered, we've got way more than that, that your presence would come, that you are right there in the middle of us. And we thank you for that today. We pray, Lord, for any of us that have brought burdens today, weights, heaviness in our heart, Lord, that it would just fall off as we worship you today. Lord, as we cast all our cares on you, we know that you care for us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that promise in your word in 1 Peter, Lord. Bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship.
Let's thank him today with a big, big round of applause for, for Jesus, right? Give him a hand. He's done all these things we've talked about. He's changed our lives, changed our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and our minds today. Would you just raise up this, this attitude of praise, this attitude of worship for who you are today? May we not just be burdened by the things of this world, burdened by the things that want to tear us down, but instead we may realize that we serve the risen Savior, the one who has done it all for us, the one who loved us before we repented, before we were doing anything better than what we could do before. We were just full, full in sin. Instead, you died for us so that we could be free. We could be set free from the bondage of sin, and we are in that place now. So we pray you'd help us to walk in that, to understand it, not to live in what we were doing before, but to walk forward into something new, Lord. We're so thankful, Jesus. We're so thankful for what you've done, and so we praise your name today. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for what you're doing uh, in our kids' ministry and youth and junior youth. Lord, I think we had 15, or no, sorry, 49 uh, people under 18 in the building on Thursday and Friday between all the groups. And so, Lord, we're so thankful to have just the influence of, of so many children, so many young people for you, Lord, letting them know that they can be free as well. They can walk in you and that you'll always be with them. Father, we just want to pray uh, for the Independent Assemblies of God today and Pastor Bob, Bob McFarlane. Uh, would you just be with that church today, God? May they just be uh, knowing your presence, knowing your leading, Lord God. Give them strength in this time. God, would you just bless them today uh, as they worship and serve you, Lord. Father, we just pray for Trevor and his mom, Marlene. Just be with them in the different ways that they just need your, your healing touch, Lord God. Give them your strength. Uh, give them your hope, Lord. Uh, and so we're just thankful that how you're with us when things are struggles, when, we're, when we need something, God. But we all, you're also with us in the good times, Lord. So would you just uh, be with them today, God, uh, as well as anyone else here who has a need, a uh, physical need, God. Would you just bring healing and bring your touch, Lord, and bring your hope to them today. We thank you for all that you do, Lord, and in, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. I like that song, Rob. I think we should do that again when we start the next package. I think we should get everybody spinning around. You know what I'm saying? Not just the pastor. Get everybody, you know, because uh, it's... Does anybody here know that you have been freed from sin? Come on, we have a reason to celebrate. There's a bunch of people on TV tonight. They're going to be like yelling and screaming about a football team, about this pigskin. It's about this big. It's only about this big. You know, and it's whether somebody can cross this little white line. Everybody goes crazy. We are set free by Jesus. Amen. We have a reason to celebrate. Hallelujah. Woo. Pastor Paul's fired up this morning. So for those of you that maybe are, don't have a type A personality, my apologies. But, uh, you know, this is just what you're going to get this morning because I'm fired up. I just, that song got me fired up today. Thanks, Rob, for singing that. Okay, now for some exciting announcements. Nominations for the church board close next Sunday. So if you're a member and you'd like to nominate someone, the nomination uh, slate is at the kiosk. And uh, the 7th of March is a Monday night. We are going to have our annual meeting. And uh, we are just so thankful. I just want to say, I, I just can't believe it. We had a board meeting a couple weeks ago. And we are so blessed by the faithfulness of God's people. We had a record year in giving last year. Like, it's absolutely amazing. Here we are in the middle of a pandemic, you know, or whatever you call this thing. How many know it's going to be over soon? Come on now. And, uh, and uh, you know, we just had an amazing year. Like, amazing. I'm not talking, like, the, the church property thing was another blessing. But aside from that, just our regular giving was just amazing, and I just want to say thank you, Lord, and thank you, people, for your willingness, the body of Christ, to just pour into the church. I mean, I've said this before, but even, even in that small period, very small, last year in the winter there, January, February, before we got outside, you know, when we were even closed, like where we didn't have services, people were sending in their e-transfers at 1030 on a Sunday morning. Like, even when we had church time, I just, that just blew me away. That just encouraged me so much. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness to the house of the Lord. Two weeks today, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, February 27th, which, by the way, is the day before my birthday, just in case you wanted to know. Uh, Pastor Mike and Sheila Middlebrook are coming in the house. 
How many remember the Middlebrooks? Oh, it's going to be a great Sunday. That would not be one to take off. Um, you, uh, it's going to be awesome. Mike and Sheila, all during these last two years, have been doing ministry in Africa. How, how do they do that, Pastor Paul? You couldn't even fly a year ago. They just go on this online stuff, this, the Zoom ministries. They're Zooming to Tanzania, and they're Zooming to Uganda, and they're Zooming to Kenya. And they've been, Pastor Mike's been teaching at like 2, 3 in the morning, because how many know their time is different over there in the other content, continent? And he's been doing like these week-long courses online with classes in the, in the continent of Africa. And so they're going to come and share uh, in two weeks. And I'm just, I'm just looking forward to seeing them. You know, it's just great. They pastored our church, and, and I followed them. And I'm just so thankful for their ministry and their heart and pastor's heart to teach, and, and so we're really looking forward to that. It's going to be a great time. Birthdays and anniversaries. Now, Trevor mentioned to me, he's hiding right now. He was up in the soundboard, but he's officially gone. Trevor mentioned to me that he, he's here. Trevor, where are you? Oh, I see a hand. He's waving. Trevor mentioned to me that a couple weeks ago, the beginning of February, was his and his mom's birthday. Now, he hasn't been here the last two weeks, so how many think we should sing to Trevor this morning? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyone else? Birthdays or anniversaries? Okay, we're going to go one at a time here because my brain, I can't see people with the, who is that? Joel, sorry, with the, uh, there you are. Okay, I see the smile now. Joel, who we got back there? Kingsley? You got a birthday? Okay. Who else? Mark? Ellis, okay, Mark, okay, anyone else? Back here, oh, lots of Februarys, eh? Who we got back there? Andrew, that's a good name, that's my second name. You met it your first, that's awesome. Andrew, anyone else? Chris and Christine, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, Valentine's Day, I remember that, Valentine's Day. We, we got... Oh, wait a sec. Oh, Kev, I'm so glad you, Kev, I'm, Kev, I'm so glad you got that in. Thank you, Lord. Oh, that's just going to save you lots of, that's just great, buddy. We got one up here. Josie. Josie? Happy birthday, Josie. February's a great month. Mine's coming up, remember, 27. Janice, Janice you got a birthday? Friday. Friday. This Friday. This past Friday, awesome. Anyone else up here? Did I miss someone? Wow, what's that, 70, 700? How many was that? A lot, anyway. We better sing loud. How many of you put on your singing voice here? Come on. Come on, Rob, razz it up a little bit. Give us a little drums there, Nick. Come on, let's go. Here we go. Come on. The anniversary to you. Cha-cha-cha. Birthday anniversary. Cha-cha-cha. Birthday anniversary special people. Happy birthday. Okay, so Pastor Drew, we guess we got the kids going heading downstairs, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord. Parents, if you could, if you're new today, if you could sign your uh, kids in downstairs, that'd be great. And uh, Rob's going to come back and lead us. Bless your brother. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, sure. What song are we doing again?
Father, we thank you so much for the, the promise in that song. Whatever we are walking through, when we put our hope in you, Lord, you are a rock. Thank you, Lord. Even this week as uh, I was enjoying some prayer times in the sanctuary, you reminded me of some of the beautiful psalms and some of the incredible titles of, of your name. the anchor and the rock and the strong tower and the shelter and Lord you're just so good to us Lord there are times in our lives when we're really walking through some stuff and I know that in a group this size that we have some folks here uh, here today that are walking through some challenging times but I also know Lord that David when he wrote the Psalms one of the Psalms that he wrote he he, uh, he said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. You know, sometimes we just got to speak to that soul part of ourselves and just regardless of what we are walking through, we need to choose to just bless your name, Lord. Oh, and it's not easy, but Lord, help us, not just in the good times, but in the challenging times, not just in the mountain, when we're on the mountaintop, but when we're in the valleys too, Lord, to, to bless your name because you're worthy, Lord. You're worthy of our praise. And Lord, you are with us, whether we're in the, up on the mountain or whether we're in the valley. I thank you that you are with us, Lord. God, would you bless your word today? Just encourage us from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I have uh, been challenged personally by uh, this series that we're doing. If you're new with us today, we're, we're doing a series. It's been a long time since I've tackled uh, any of the chapters uh, in, in Revelation. And um, just to put you at ease, at rest this morning, I'm not doing the 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. Uh, I'm just doing the first three chapters. Maybe later we'll... we'll, we'll, we'll We'll get into some other ones, but I'm just doing the first three chapters, and we're already, we're only halfway through chapter two, and we're at part five, so I think it's probably going to be a, an eight or a nine week series by the time we're done, but I've just been enjoying um, going back into, uh, into the book of Revelation, and uh, the first chapter, we, we talked about uh, really the vision of Christ that's seen in chapter one and it's actually quite different from some of you many of you have seen the pictures maybe you've seen them on a on a Sunday school wall or or whatever of of uh, classroom of, of uh, Jesus you know sitting and there's a, there's always a tree in behind him for shade right and there's one kid on his lap and there's others all around. how many have seen a picture like that come on okay this is a little different picture of Jesus here you know, and, and that the vision of, of Jesus in, in Revelation chapter chapter one, um, you know, and, and so we, we, we did a couple weeks there, and now we are doing we're going through the different churches in the book of Revelation, and uh, today we are talking about Pergamum. So I just want just because some of you have never heard that word before, I just want you to. Say that a couple times. Just go ahead, say that. Pergamum. Pergamum, now you're so. Uh, and we're going to start reading it. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. Is anybody tired today? Anyone? I see that yawn. Revelation chapter 2. 
And to the angel, oh, I guess I'll put this up on the big screen for you here. There we go. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have, sorry, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. You know, in verse 12, it talks about this, uh, the angel to the church in Pergamum, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. And, you know, this is another example of, I told you that each of the churches... Um, the seven churches in the book of Revelation, that when we saw the vision in chapter 1, there were uh, many of those phrases, those descriptions about Jesus that are given to each of the churches. And here, it's the sword. Pergamum as a city. Now, does anybody here know where Pergamum is? Everybody, anybody ever been there? Does anybody know where Pergamum is? And, Anyone want to take a guess? Yes! Eveline, you know, you're, I'm going to get you a chocolate bar, Eveline. Because you've answered a few questions when I haven't had a chocolate bar up here. But I'm going to get one. Yes, all of the churches, it's, it's an easy answer. All of the churches in the book of Revelation, all seven churches, are in the modern day country of Turkey. So, if you say Turkey, you're going to be right. Just remember that around Thanksgiving time. If you say Turkey, you're going to be right. Pergamum was a center for healing and the worship of many Greek and Roman gods. It was built on an extremely steep hill and a colonnade led, led to a large square which was used to be the temple of... No, I'm not, I'm not, I know I'm not going to say this right. Uh, Aesculapius. Aesculapius. Anybody here is an expert on Greek gods? Uh, it was 120 feet high, and around were pictures depicting the God of healing. Not the God of healing that we know, but the God of healing that they thought they know. In the center of this room was one piece of furniture. It was a short, round stone pillar, four foot high, and, and, care, and carved on the one side of the pillar were two intertwined stake, snakes. Sorry, This was the altar to this god. But I'm not going to pronounce his name. It begins with an A. <laughs> People would come, and they would give a votive offering of trust to the god, and then they'd be led to this pool, and they'd be invited to step down into the pool, and the priest would figure out the nature of their sickness. The priest would. They wouldn't tell him. He'd figure it out. And um, what would happen is uh, he would tell them, he would determine how much money they needed to give as an offering in order to be healed. Yeah. 
And uh, this, uh, this, the main bartering would happen, and uh, the patient would find out the price, and then it would, they would go back and forth uh, to, to the price to secure the healing. If it was enough, then the water would flood into the pool. When they walked into it, it was like just ankle deep. The water would flood into the pool. If it was not enough, only a trickle would come into the pool. Effective healing was only possible when the water rose to waist level. So if you had a little dabble do ya, if you had a little trickle, you know, that wasn't enough. Unknown to the patient that was standing in the pool, a priest hidden on the other side of the pool was listening to the process and was lifting or dropping a sub Terranean slab of stone that allowed a spring to feed the water into the pool. I mean, this is amazing. This is like, this is way back. Like, this isn't, you know, you think about, now there's some of you here, we got a few carpenters, a few builders here. Some of you in your mind right now, you're thinking, wow, that, that, that's a long time ago. And that was quite, quite interesting what, what they were doing. The higher the price, the higher the price of the offering, the sooner the God sent the water. So this is kind of, this was in Pergamum. At the summit of the hill where the Acropolis was built were gods of every occasion. And, oh, by the way, I wanted to show you a picture of that. This is a picture of that pool I was talking about. See, you go down the steps. See the colonnade in the background? In there is the center. You go down these steps into the pool there, and I'm not sure. It's, 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 that's the best picture I could find, but somewhere, probably on this side, the front end of it, was this contraption they built to let the water uh, into the pool. At the summit of the hill where the Acropolis was built were gods of every occasion. There was a very large temple, and this was where the emperor of Rome was worshipped. There is a strong tradition that it was the temple Jesus had in mind when he talked about Satan's throne that we read in, in the verses that we read at the beginning. Domitian, the emp one of the emperors, had decreed that he should be known as our Lord and our God. I mean, you know, it's dangerous when you declare that you want to be known as our Lord and our God. Other opinions of Satan's throne included all kinds of pagan worship offered a, offering to this this pillar, this four-foot-high stone pillar known as the seat of Satan. There were many, many, many occultic and black arts and paganism all practiced at this temple. And so we see again, and we, we talked about it previously, some of the churches, the ungodliness of this area. And... Um, there are two major errors in response to all the sin, all the immorality, all the idol worship in Pergamum. And both of these responses to this stuff were errors. Okay, and that's kind of one of the main focuses that we're going to talk about this morning. Some Christians in Pergamum opened the door for some Christians to justify and a reinterpretation of Christian behavior on the same grounds that Christianity and pagan worship uh, were ultimately the same thing, that they could be done together. And so I want to, just for a few moments, talk about, um, 
talk about these things. There was really three groups. The first group that we read in Revelation were the persecuted Christians that kept the faith. They kept the faith during this time. They were persecuted. I mentioned before about Domitian. There were those Christians, a small group. How many have ever heard the term remnant before? They were a remnant of Christians that kept the faith. There were two other groups. The first group was called the Balaamites. Now, does anybody ever remember the story of Balaam and Balak in the Old Testament? A few folks, okay. All right. Those that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam was a good prophet of Israel. He was, however, very easily bought for the right price and persuaded ancient Israel against its better judgment to share in an ecumenical project with foreign nations. What this led to was the men of Israel, under Balaam, because he was a prophet, marrying women from other, uh, other nations that practiced all kinds of idolatry and paganism. They went away from the one true God, Jehovah, and they adopted, and they, they, you know, they basically became unequally yoked in their belief systems, and they got together. This, this project led to forbidden marriages, forbidden worship, apostasy, all acts of disobedience against the covenant relationship with God. The result during Balaam's time was a plague that killed many, many people and sent the whole nation into mourning. I mean, that is, that's just a brief summary of what happened with Balaam. The Balaamites' heresy basically was they persuaded Christians that all things religious are good and would eventually lead to God. So they did not agree with the first basic creed of Christianity that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That was the very, very basic first creed of Christianity. Forget all the other stuff. You know, every church has all kinds of other little, you know, this church does this over here, this church does that over there. They believe in this, some sprinkle, some full immersion. You know, all those extra things. The basic creed of the church was Jesus is Lord, which means he is the only authority in our lives. The Balaamites believed everybody is Lord. You can add this, you can take this and have a chunk of that and bring in a bit of this and over here. And, and maybe some of you would say that there's, there's parallels to this today. People have brought in other religions into Christianity. One example of that would be Hinduism. You know, people that, that uh, practice in a spiritual capacity, practice yoga. I'm not talking about exercise. I'm talking about all the basic understanding. Yoga comes from the Hindu religion. So you need to be careful if that's something that you... Uh, choose to be a part of, if it's for exercise, you need to be careful because there are elements of that particular practice, especially in the area of where in the transcendental meditation, when people empty their minds, empty their minds, as to when you choose to empty your mind, what comes in, right? So there are practices today, there are examples today of what I would call modern Balaamites, if you will, where people have picked and choose different things from different religions, and some, some would call this syncretism, where they, they bring them together. They've got this piece from over here and this piece from over here. And ultimately, though, with the Balaamites in the, in the, in the uh, New Testament, it was much more severe as some of the practices that some of the other religions had. You know, uh, all kinds of uh, all kinds of things that would be pagan would be pagan. The second uh, main group were the Nicolaitans, and we talked a bit about this 
when we talked about Ephesus, but I just want to re-emphasize it. The Nicolaitans consisted of individuals who changed the gospel, changed the gospel to suit their private theology of freedom of love. They were sophisticated in their approach. They added insult to injury by describing their wicked lifestyle as Christian liberty. Christian liberty. Listen to a quote from, uh, from the author of the book that I've been sharing with you on the seven churches. If a decision for Jesus Christ is not based totally upon repentance for sin, then there is little on which to call for a changed lifestyle. If the former lifestyle is not recognized as sin, then the purpose in coming to Jesus is always the positive, what might be gained, God on a string purpose. What does this mean? Well, basically... Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it in, in a little bit uh, when it comes to, uh, it, it, more specifically when it comes to the Nicolaitans. But it's, when you look at Romans 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still, sorry, how shall we who died to sin still live in it. The Nicolaitans believed that because of the grace of God, you can do whatever you want because God's going to forgive you. The only issue with that is if you don't ask for forgiveness and you get hit by a Mack truck. <laughs> well, that's, so that's, a little, that's a little extreme, Pastor Paul. How many know we're not promised tomorrow? So it's a very dangerous place when we sort of hold on to the grace of God, hoping, you know, you know that, well, we know God's going to forgive us because he's a God of grace and a God of love. Jesus loves us, right? But where we involve ourselves sometimes in habitual sin because we know that God is love and God forgives. That's a dangerous place to be. The Nicolaitans, that's basically what they believed. So three groups, persecuted Christians who kept the faith, those that showed a tolerant attitude towards paganism and other religions, other belief systems, other worldviews in the church, and those that claimed Christian liberty as their mandate, that they were free to do whatever they wanted because God would forgive them. Jesus said, to these two groups. Repent or I am coming quickly. And then he said, to him who overcomes, I will give, and I'm just going to go to our last slide here. To him who overcomes, I will give hidden manna and a white stone with our name written on it. And I want to talk a bit about that. Let's go back just for a second to the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans, because we've got a bit of time, and I just want to unpack this a little more. Because how many of you discover that when you're reading something in the Scripture, that sometimes it's like, well, what the heck does that have to do with me today? I don't understand that. Like, Pastor Paul, what are you talking about Balaamites? Like, I, yeah, I sort of remember the, that prophet in the Old Testament, you know, um, let me just talk a little more about this, Balaamites, paganism in the church. There are other parallels to this. How many of you have ever heard the term before, universalism? Yes, have you heard that term before? Universalism is the idea, basically, that all roads lead to Rome. Has anybody ever heard that phrase? All roads lead to Rome. In other words, um, ultimately, that everyone will make it to heaven. Like, if you're a good person, you know, you just like, you know, you're just nice to people. You're nice to your neighbor. Every once in a while, you notice the grass is getting real long. Then you find out that they ran out of gas. You know, you just kind of slip over there, you know, do a little cut, you know, and, and, and um, you know, just be good. Just be a good person, and you'll go to heaven. 
The question that needs to be asked is, if that's true, why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Why did Jesus have to die for our sins if you can believe whatever you want and get to heaven? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that Jesus had to suffer a horrible death, not just the physical, you know, everybody likes to talk about the, the physical elements of the crucifixion, but literally had the whole sin of the world placed on his shoulders and died on a cross in our place. Two verses that immediately come to mind for me that just really speak to me are Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. And it's easy to remember those because they're just three three chapters apart. And some of us here, maybe many of us, are, these would be a couple of verses that we would remember if you've grown up in the church. The first one is, for all have sinned and fall, sh and, sorry, and fall short of the glory of God. Right? How many is all? That's everyone, right? <laughs> That's me. That's all of us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 6.23 says, the wages of sin, in other words, what we deserve, is death. That's, that's it. Like you, What you've earned for sinning is death. The wages of sin is death. But, always pay attention when you see the but. The, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? We deserve death, but because of what Christ has done on the cross, we are forgiven. And so it's very important that we be, we be extremely careful when it comes to this kind of, this idea that you can just basically be a good person, believe whatever you want, and heaven is yours. That's why it's so important that we share the gospel with people. That's why it's so important. You know, it's, it's very interesting when you look at the history of a lot of movements and a lot of denominations in the world. A lot of them, the only reason why they actually organized and kind of came together is because they wanted su to support and sponsor missionaries and church planters to go all through Canada and all over the world and tell people about Jesus. And they figured if they got a bunch of them together, a bunch of churches together, and they supported this person and that person. You know, we have people that we support here in the church that are in areas of the world where there are unreached people groups where people have never once heard the message of Jesus. That's, that's the Balaamites. The second thing, the Nicolaitans, the abuse of Christian liberty. I mentioned to you the Romans chapter 6 passage, you know, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be, or literally, God forbid. Secondly, Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but their deeds deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Whoa, that's, that's heavy-duty stuff. There are times when if people continue to walk in sin and live in sin, there are times there is a danger that their conscience could be seared. Literally, that, you know, after doing it for a while, it's a very dangerous place to be when you choose, because, hey, God's, you know, God's, God's love, God loves me, lots of grace, you know, Jesus died on the cross, so I can just ask for forgiveness. There's a danger there where a conscience our conscience can be seared. That's a very, very dangerous place to be in. The last thing I want to talk about, which is, I know this is 
There's been some challenging parts of this message. Are the rewards for remaining strong even in times of persecution, which is really what Pergamum at the time was going through. The first one is uh, the two things that are mentioned. I want to read it again because it's been a while since we, uh, we read that. So I just want to read that last. Uh, he who has an ear, let, verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. The first thing that Jesus says is that I will give, I will give the hidden manna. Now, I didn't know when I first read this what specifically this was talking about, so I, I did some reading and, and looked at a, a few commentaries. Basically, the, the whole parallel in the New Testament of this hidden manna is receiving Jesus in all his fullness. Jesus is often called the bread of life. Amen? He's called the bread of life. And this speaks of his presence in our life helping us. Has anybody ever had one of those Murphy's Day or Murphy's Week, Murphy's Law Weeks? Anybody ever had one of those? Like Pastor Paul woke up this morning and, and now, I, like, believe me, this is, some of this is, you're going to say like Pastor Paul, that's, that's first world problems, like you've got issues there. Like, we don't have a bathroom right now. It's torn apart, right? So I already knew that I wasn't going to have a shower, and that's why I'm preaching a little distance this morning. I already knew that I wasn't going to have a shower this morning, and I was having my toast and stuff and that. And so I went out to my car to start my car to come to church early, and the car wouldn't start. And when you live at my house, there's, you know, we, we have two cars. So again, first world problems. I mean, I'm, I'm really suffering, right? But anyways, but the car that wouldn't start was behind the car that would start. But I couldn't get it out because there's a pile of snow on both sides. Because how you know Pastor Paul just does minimal snow shoveling? All right, it's called time management, okay? And so, so, so I thought, well, I'm not going to try and push my car up by myself this morning because uh, I don't need that for my heart right now. So I, so I walked to church, you know, and uh, you know, and uh, but I want you to know something. That, you know, this week <laughs> I. Uh, it was, a, it, was a, it was a challenging week. But you know what? I, I just, we had some prayer times this week at the church. And I, I, I know that it's, it's my fault that I didn't announce that earlier. But I know that those that were able to come, I just, I had one person say in one of the evening sessions, you know, it just, the Lord has just really showed me this week that I need to go deeper. I need to find some times for this. And that meant everything to me because that's why I did it. I actually did it for myself. I knew that with everything that we've gone through, you know, in the last weeks and months and years, like I just, I just wanted some time. So I figured, well, if I do it like a, <laughs> if I do it for the church, then I know I got to be here and, you know, it's going to make me get to, you know, to do it, right? And uh, we need the living presence. We need the bread of life. We need the hidden manna of Jesus in our lives, amen? And, you know, and when you look, when you think manna, again, when we talked about Balaam, when you think of manna, when you look in the Old Testament about manna, how, when did they get the manna? Was it just like a once a month deal? Every day they walked out and it was on the ground. Now the only exception to that, right, was, was on the Sabbath, which is, oh, oh, that, that, that part of the scripture always amazes me that God gave them twice the day before the Sabbath so they didn't have to collect it on the Sabbath. Like, you know, it's like the rest of the week they got like one of those junior whoppers, but on the, they got the, like the bigger one. Anyways, manna. Secondly, a white stone. A white stone. A white, uh, white stone. There's three uh, sort of theories about what this white stone was with a new name written on it. The first one is it's a symbol of an entry ticket to a royal banquet. Wow. I can't wait for that royal banquet. 
the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? A ticket. There's lots of old gospel songs that talk about the ticket, eh? You know, for the train or whatever, right? The second one is the acquittal stone used in law courts. A black stone represented a guilty verdict. Christ gives a sign of acquittal and bears his name as the one who paid it all. White stone. The third thing is it's a symbol of purity. Purity of Christ given to the believer whereby the recipient receives a new name and a new standing before God. A new name and a new standing before God. You remember uh, in the scripture where it talks about our names, amen, being written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony. Do you know that your name is written down when you ask Jesus to come into your life? It's like a contract. It's like when Jesus was dying on the cross and he, and he was hanging there and he said, Ted Lestai, it is finished. Literally, a term that was used when a payment was paid, paid in full. God paid the price for us. In conclusion today, I'm going to ask uh, Rob if he, if he wants to come up. In conclusion for us, I want us to think about these two groups of people. I want to think about us to think about the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans. The first one, this whole idea of believing whatever you want. Paganism, beliefs that are, that are, that are, that are, they're anti-God. You know, there's, 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 there's Christian institutions. There's universities, there's Christian institutions, there's churches in our nation that believe things that are totally opposed to God. In the nation of Canada. There are people that believe that you can believe whatever you want and you'll get to heaven. Just got to be a nice person. It's not enough to be a nice person. That is not our ticket. There's nothing that we can do personally to earn it. Jesus already paid it. It's because of his righteousness. It's because of what he did on the cross that we have salvation. Secondly, this whole idea of this abuse of Christian liberty, where we would be in a place where we would, where we would, because of God's grace, we would take advantage of that. Now, please understand me. Uh, anybody ever go through that when you were a kid? Those of you that grew up in the church or came in later, doesn't matter when. But you know where you were always worried if you lost your salvation. Was anybody there? Anybody? You know, oh, yeah, you know, you know, and then you saw the movie of Thief in the Night, and then you came home and no one was home, and you thought they all left, they got raptured or whatever, right? <laughs> you know, you have to understand that G when Jesus died on the cross, and when we accept what he did for us, he died for our past, our present, and our future sins, amen? Okay, so it's not like, you know, it's not like, you know, a game where you know, one day you can have your salvation and the next day you can lose it. I don't believe that. But I believe that we need to be very careful when we live a lifestyle where we take the grace of God for granted. Amen? And we just, oh yeah, I can do that because I'm just going to ask God, you know, later, the end of the day or whatever for forgiveness. The enemy can use those things in our lives, those habits, you know, that habitual, I'm not talking about just, you know, like, uh, you know, a little sin, you know, oh, you, uh, an untruth or whatever. Well, there's, no, no real, there's no real such thing as little or big sin, right? It's all sin. But, 
you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about you wondering whether you are saved or not. If you've asked Jesus to come into your life, his sacrifice was great enough, amen? But what I'm talking about is when we take it for granted, we take the grace of God for granted, just be careful. It's a dangerous place to walk, and it's a really dangerous place to walk when we get to that point where all of a sudden something doesn't bother us anymore. We do something, and that, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't convict us anymore. Our consciences are being seared. We become hard to it. Those are very, very challenging places. We don't want to, you know, to come to that place. We need to be, amen, quick to ask for forgiveness. Like daily. You know, it's in the Lord's Prayer, right? You know, you know, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us or trespass against us, right? It's a daily thing that we need to just be asking the Lord God. Just, Lord, I, I had that thought the other day, and I don't even know where it came from. Well, I know where it came from, Lord. It's probably the devil or whatever. But I had that thought, and I, I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have had that thought. Lord, just forgive me. Just, Lord, just forgive me. You know? um, live, live quick to ask for the Lord's forgiveness. Amen? The manna and the white stone. We need to understand that Jesus is there for us every day, just like that manna in the wilderness. Jesus wants to give us his fullness, wants to help us daily as we walk through things, and to remember the blessed hope, the great hope of that white stone, amen, that we have his cleansing, that we have his purity, and that we have this assurance that our name is written down, Pergamum. Let's pray together. Just want to ask today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe God has spoken to you about something that I've shared. Maybe it's uh, maybe it was in the context of how you were raised or maybe it's just where you find yourself now. And uh, maybe you're here and you'd say, Pastor Paul, I think at some point in my life, or even right now, I have I've taken the grace of God for granted. And I just need the Lord's prayer to, to make sure that's not something going forward that I want to do. Just just slip up a hand with your heads bowed, eyes closed. Anyone at all, you've kind of taken that for granted. Yep. Anyone else? You can put it down now. Anyone else? How many of you here, and you would say that there has been times when you have um, adopted other beliefs or maybe you know someone that's uh, you know they just they've kind of grabbed a bunch of different things from a bunch of different places and uh, and you want to make sure that you are focusing on the one true God today anyone at all that would say that is your issue How many of you would say, Pastor Paul, I have felt, I have sensed like that first group that you talked about, I have actually felt this year persecution for what I believe in the Lord. Just slip up a hand. Anyone? Anyone at all? You've, you've, you've felt persecution from someone? Jesus. Father, sometimes it's hard when we read your word and we, we think it's so extreme. We think of this community as Pergamum and you know, all this idolatry and, and, and paganism and stuff that was going on. And, it, we, you know, I mean, some of us, it's, it's like our feeling is, oh, this is so different than today. It doesn't even relate to us today. But, God, it does relate to us because our nation is filled with it. It's filled with it. People are worshiping all kinds of things. They're putting value in, in things that literally are, are pulling them away or totally distracting them from you, Lord. And Lord, we're not going to get up there and just, you know, start yelling and start, you know, bringing our 50-pound Bibles, you know. But somehow through our love and through our example and through our life, would you help us to be there for people that actually believe that you can believe whatever you want and, and go to heaven or, 
you know, Lord, help, help them to know that Jesus is the only way. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through you. Lord, I pray for those that have, have struggled a little bit, maybe with one of these issues. Lord, the hands that went up this morning. Lord, would you just, just help them to just say a simple prayer? God, I want you to be first. Jesus is Lord. You're Lord, and you're Lord of my life. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to find a way to still share your love and your grace. They're very real. But, Lord, to share the truth in love. Help us to be able to do that. Lord, I pray this week, maybe around the water cooler or maybe at the coffee shop or maybe when we're out for a walk or with a neighbor or with a relative, that you give us an opportunity to share your gospel this week, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a final song. Father, I just pray today as we leave this place that you would go with us. Lord, we thank you for the promise of your word that says perfect love casts out all fear. Lord, we have nothing to be afraid of because you are with us. And you go with us, Lord. 
Lord, you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So walk, help us to walk in your spirit this week and to encourage others around us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great day.